Well, I am very pleased to be here this morning to talk to you about the topic of my recently published book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War, which does indeed tell the story, and it's a previously untold story, of physical violence in the House and Senate chambers in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Now, I'm going to admit to you right at the outset that 17 years ago when I began writing this book, it did not feel quite so timely <laughs> as it feels nowadays. This has proven to be a very interesting moment to come out with a book on extreme polarization in American politics and congressmen behaving badly. What has remained consistent pretty much throughout those 17 years is that throughout that time, I've discovered that most Americans do know about one violent incident in Congress. They don't usually know the details, so when I would go up to people throughout all those years and say, I'm writing a book about physical violence in the US Congress, they would inevitably say, well, there was that guy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and by that guy, of course, they mean, and actually that's what the image up there is of, the violent caning of abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner in 1856 while seated at his desk in the Senate chamber. Now, Sumner had given a powerful anti-slavery speech in the Senate in which he attacked the South generally and a few key Southern senators specifically, men who'd been attacking him for quite some time for his abolitionist politics. A kinsman of one of those attacked congressmen, a South Carolina representative named Preston Brooks, responded to Sumner's speech by going to the Senate chamber, telling Sumner, seated at his desk, that Sumner had dishonored his kinsman and his state and then brutally caning him over the head until his cane broke. Now the title of this book actually comes from a response to that caning. Not long after the attack, a friend of Sumner's wrote that blood would flow, somebody's blood, before the expiration of your present session on that field of blood, the floor of Congress, I have fully expected. Now, that's to me, as a historian, was a fascinating quote. For that person at that time, physical violence in Congress wasn't a surprise. This, this person expected someone to be attacked in Congress. He literally called the floor of Congress the field of blood. I have to say, as a historian, that's a Nirvana quote that you say, thank you very much, <laughs> history gods, for giving me the code. I now have a title for my book. So that was a, a remarkable letter to find. Now, Today, certainly, people don't normally envision the antebellum Congress in that way. I think they mostly think of Clay and Webster, right? Henry Clay, Daniel Webster. I, my image is they kind of see people standing around, you know, in black frock coats doing this. It's kind of <laughs> their image of the antebellum Congress. But in fact, there was a lot of violence in the House and Senate chambers between 1830 and 1860. In my research, I found roughly 70 physically violent incidents in the pre-Civil War Congress. And I would guess throughout that time that maybe roughly 10% of a given House of Representatives was likely to be violent. And by physically violent, I mean canings, shoving and fistfights, people pulling knives and guns on each other, duels, well, duels aren't actually taking place on the floor, but you get the idea, <laughs> dual negotiations, and wild melees, usually in the House, with bunches of men rolling in the aisles, throwing punches, and a handful of street fights with fists, bricks, and the occasional umbrella. Now clearly, this is a dramatic story, which raises a really obvious question. Why hasn't it been told before? Now I have to say, I asked myself that question many times in the course of my research, and there's a good answer. Most of the violence was censored out of the period's equivalent of the congressional record. At the time, the Congressional Globe and the National Intelligence are two different newspapers. Now, there are clues in the records. So, for example, every now and again, the record will say something like, the debate became unpleasantly personal at one point. <laughs> Now, if you didn't know what was going on, you would just think, oh, you know, some harsh words were explained. Uh, in one case, a congressman pulled a knife on another congressman. That is unpleasantly personal. <laughs> or the record will say something like, there was a sudden sensation in the corner 
In one case, two congressmen got in a fist fight and flipped their desk over, so that was indeed a sudden sensation. Enormous brawls tend to get mentioned, but only in the barest detail, as in the case of one enormous fight in 1849 that was summed up in this wonderfully poetic way in the record by the reporter. He just put in brackets, the house is like a heaving billow. <laughs> Thank you, reporter for Congress. Now, that leads to another question, which is why such limited accounts of violence? And in part, that has to do with the nature of the Washington press in this period. In the 1830s, the Washington press consisted of a handful of men working for a handful of local Washington newspapers who sat in the House and Senate, scribbled notes, checked them with the congressman who'd been speaking, and then published their accounts not only in newspapers, but in spin-off publications that basically acted as a congressional record. The newspapers that these reporters worked for were unquestionably partisan. So objective news is not on the radar screen at this point, if they had radar screens. I guess that's not the best metaphor. So as a reporter, it was in your interest to make your party's congressman look good. It was also in your interest as a reporter to make congressmen look good because Congress granted government printing contracts and most newspapers relied on those contracts for survival. Plus, unhappy congressmen occasionally slugged the reporter who made them unhappy. <laughs> so for all of those reasons, the Washington press had many reasons to smooth over the rough edges of what happened in Congress which means that although the Washington press played up the bravado of many congressmen, they left most of the nasty, violent details out. So why hasn't the story of congressional violence been told? Because it's exceedingly hard to find. If you're not looking for it, you won't see it. Which isn't to say that the Globe and the Intelligencer, these two newspapers, don't have value as congressional records that go deeper than debates. And in fact, the record, that equivalent of the record in this period, is a remarkable cultural document that's not often treated that way. I mean, people tend, and it makes sense, right? They go to the congressional record to see, well, what's the debate over Kansas like? What they don't do is look to see how people are interacting with each other, right? What does the record show about that? So I spent a full year reading the record as an entry to uncovering what I wanted to understand about the culture of Congress. I will admit to you, um, I think over the course of writing this book, so 17 years, I think I wore out the seat of three desk chairs, <laughs> which just tells you how much time I spent sitting at my desk. And one, one of those desk chairs died for the congressional record, I will say. Uh, so looking at that record, I learned about things like the pacing of debate, the way people treated each other, the things that set people off, the things that didn't set people off, but by modern standards, at least, seemingly should have. So the record was invaluable, as were newspapers, and particularly databases of newspapers. And I have to say here, first of all, the book wouldn't have been possible without databases. It truly wouldn't. Because if you think about what I'm saying here, that it was impossible to find this evidence, the only way I could find it was to strategically search, look in different databases, piece things together, and it happens to be a Redex collection, America's Historical Newspapers. Like, I sing the praise of America's Historical Newspapers because that enabled me to sit at my desk and just rummage through newspapers. The record would, I would look at one of these unpleasantly personal moments and I would look at the date and then I could go sitting at my desk into the newspapers and see if they said anything about what happened on that date. So, you know, I say to my students all the time, there are certain kinds of books that weren't possible before you had databases. You know, you couldn't do that kind of broad searching. So in some ways, this is that kind of a database book. And I, just thinking as a historian, so I've been a historian long enough that my first book was not a database book. It was a me traveling around the country going to archives book. I could sit at my desk and I could read the equivalent of the congressional record. I could go to newspapers and check to see what they said. I could go to Google Books and find uh, memoirs of some of the obscure congressmen that I was writing about. I could find collections of documents, manuscripts, letters of some of the people I was writing about. 
and piece together these fights while sitting at my desk. Right, that kind of, I'm probably of the generation of historians that that dumbfounded me. And every once in a while I would think, I'm at my desk. <laughs> I haven't left my desk. Like, this is amazing. So all of those things were invaluable. Another particularly valuable source for me, and these I tended to find in archives, was men writing letters to their wives. In the letters, these men often revealed how they felt, which in a study of violence proved to be an exceptionally important insight. So in letters to their wives, congressmen described really their feelings as well as what they saw. They admitted to their wives that they were nervous at the tone of debate in the room. They admitted to their wives that they were trying to count how many fellow representatives seemed to be armed. So there's one letter in which, in this case, it's a congressman writing to his wife and saying that he and a friend in the House of Representatives thought that there were maybe 70 people in the room who were armed, which is a remarkable statement. A few in these letters to their wives even jokingly noted that perhaps only large men should be elected to Congress. <laughs> it's kind of a daunting place. Now, all of that obviously is anecdotal, but it definitely says something suggestive about the dynamics of power on the floor of Congress. And that idea proved to be really vital for me in understanding how Congress worked. So what did I find with that kind of insight? Well, not surprisingly, when I looked at the violence and the intimidation over the 30-year period at the heart of the book, I saw patterns. So for one thing, the House was more physically violent than the Senate, which I suppose in a sense isn't surprising. The Senate, a smaller and more personal institution, whose members were sometimes of higher social status than members of the House, tended towards dual challenges. The House was far rougher, tending towards scuffles, pushing, shoving, fist fights, and wielded weapons. Pistols and bowie knives were particular favorites. And I will say bowie knives, I'm not someone, despite the fact that I write about political violence, I can't say that I had seen most of these weapons before. And from what I can tell from the record, these congressmen mostly in this case, I think Western congressmen, Southern-born Western congressmen, wore these Bowie knives strapped to their back so that they could, <laughs> I see shocked expressions. I know, that's what I felt too. <laughs> Shocking. Um, but people knew, right? You could tell if someone was wearing a Bowie knife and that gave you a certain amount of clout in the antebellum Congress. Now, I will note, and it's important to note at this point, this kind of behavior wasn't only happening in Congress. The United States was violent in this period, exceedingly violent in this period, and Congress was a representative institution in many senses of the word. What was distinctive in Congress was the sectional complications and national implications of that kind of behavior, and I'm gonna come back to that idea momentarily. So there was an institutional pattern of violence differentiating the House from the Senate, but in addition to that institutional pattern, there's another more striking pattern of violent outbreaks that's really worth noting. And in this case, it's a geographic pattern. Generally speaking, congressmen divided their ranks into two kinds of men. And I'm about to actually offer you their lingo, so I didn't make this up. These are their words. They tended to divide their ranks into, quote, fighting men and noncombatants. Often at the beginning of a session, they would differentiate or even ask, are you a fighting man? Are you a non-combatant? And then determine their behavior based on that. So fighting men tended to be Southerners or Southern-born Westerners. They tended to be armed and willing to fight, which in a sense isn't surprising. Southern culture, a slavery-based culture, was grounded on man-to-man -man violence. Most Northerners, on the other hand, were non-combatants, which isn't to say that the North wasn't violent, it was. But Northerners, in a very general sense, tended towards rioting. Southerners tended towards man-to-man -man combat, and that proved to be a very useful skill in Congress. <laughs> Which means that, generally speaking, Southerners bullied Northerners in Congress, often to protect the institution of slavery. They insulted and threatened and sometimes assaulted Northerners to intimidate them into compliance or silence, and for a time, this strategy worked quite well. So for a time, Southerners had an outsized influence on the floor of Congress and they protected their slave regime in the process. 
So in the same way that Southerners had outside, outsized demographic power in Congress because of the three-fifths compromise, they had outsized cultural power because of the impact of their bullying. Now, that pattern in and of itself is striking, but equally striking is the fact that Southerners back home approved of their champions on the floor. They might not know the dirty details of what was going on, what their representatives were doing, but they certainly knew that their representatives were fighting, literally, for the institution of slavery, and they approved of it. So not surprisingly, fighting men from the South tended to get reelected to Congress. And this is a period when there's a churning membership in Congress. Many people serve one term. If you're lucky, you get maybe two. People appear and then vanish, sometimes actually from the historical record. So fighting men tend to get reelected. And a great example of this is a Virginia congressman named Henry Wise. He ended up being my book's most frequent fighter. Um, and he, he's not some kind of back alley brawler. He was actually an educated man. He goes on to become governor of Virginia. He was also constantly rolling up his sleeves to throw a punch. He's actually, now that I think about it, the person who kind of revealed the topic to me in the first place in a collection of letters that I was reading. I kept seeing Henry Wise like rolling up his sleeves to you know the guy writing these letters to his wife, like Henry Wise again. I you know, saw so him rolling up his sleeves. You know, so I thought, what what is this? Now, when Wise was reprimanded by a fellow congressman for his behavior, who essentially said, shame on you. You should be sent home for that kind of behavior. You should be expelled. Wise basically responded, go ahead. <laughs> Do it. I will be immediately reelected and sent right back here. My constituents want me to act as I am acting. He even says at one point what a congressman really needs is a good friend and a good weapon. So he assumed that his constituents put him there for that kind of behavior, and he was right. He was reelected a remarkable six times to Congress. His constituents approved of what he was doing. And that kind of bullying had an impact. Sometimes non-combatants resigned from committees when they were bullied. Sometimes they just chose not to speak out and object to a Southerner. And if they did, they risked what happened to one Democratic congressman in the early 1840s, when he insisted on allowing Representative John Quincy Adams to have his say on a slavery petition. A Louisiana congressman stalked over to the fellow who said, let Adams speak, and threatened to cut his throat from ear to ear, quote unquote, and of course revealed his Bowie knife to show that I, he could do it if he wanted to. Now, with those kinds of basic patterns in play, you can begin to see how there was a good deal of violence in Congress in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. You can also see why a lot of onlookers felt justified in claiming that there was what they called a slave power at the head of the national government, just as the rhetoric of the period said. So if you look at things from this time period, constantly from the North, they're complaining about the slave power, the slave power. You can see how there's a truth to that in Congress. But in the 1850s, things began to change. Now, in part, this was due to the nation's continued push west and the rising problem of slavery on western lands. So obviously, every state that was added to the Union put the question of slavery front and center in congressional debate intensifying the nation's increasingly intense debate over slavery and polarizing national politics to an ever-increasing degree. At the same time, as the nation's growth was keeping the problem of slavery front and center, a new form of technology, the telegraph, made matters worse by transmitting news around the nation with breakneck speed before politicians could spin the news as they saw fit. So as the problem of slavery intensified, the telegraph spread that intensity around the nation with increasing speed and without much congressional spin. Just as the nation's sectional conflict began to fester, a new technology spread it nationally faster than ever before. It would be hard to exaggerate the degree to which the technical innovation of the telegraph really changed the nature of politics. And it's an obvious comparison, but it's an interesting one. If you think about how we're grappling with social media today, the reach of it, the power of it, the implications of it, 
our inability to sort of control it, you begin to get a sense of what I'm talking about when I talk about the telegraph in this time period. In the 1850s, a communications revolution via the telegraph connected national politicians and the American public as never before, bringing countless complications in its wake. Democracy, if you think about it, is an ongoing conversation between office holders and constituents. And so in a sense, it should come as no surprise that dramatic changes in the modes of conversation cause dramatic changes in democracies themselves. During the sectional crisis of the 1850s, the repercussions of this really increasingly nationalized press were severe. By framing these crises for maximum impact, the press created basically an endless loop of sectional strife. Congressmen issued rallying cries to their constituents from the floor, the press played up the implications, and the public responded by urging their congressmen to fight for their rights. And these extreme emotions were broadcast throughout the Union with ever increasing speed and efficiency. The product of this cycle of stridency was pronounced by portraying Congress as an institution of extremes, extreme rhetoric, extreme policies, extreme belligerence, a place of sectional conflict waged by sectional champions, the press downplayed the appeal and even the possibility of compromise. In more ways than one, the floor of Congress became a theater of conflict, and the deaths of Daniel Webster and Henry Clay in 1852 seemed to confirm the passing of that spirit of compromise. With Americans already losing faith in the power and meaning of national political parties, national institutions of all kinds were under fire at precisely the moment when their influence most mattered. So ironically, the workings of a free press, enforcing congressional accountability, the very touchstone of a functioning democracy, were helping to tear the nation apart. The end result of these things, the rising intensity of the problem of slavery, the rise of the telegraph, was more violence in Congress, particularly given that the American public was increasingly cheering on their congressmen to fight for their rights. And by the 1850s, this was true for Northerners as well as Southerners. As Northerners got a sense of the degree to which their representatives were being silenced by bullying Southerners, they began to vote fighting men into Congress. The anti-slavery Republican Party came to power in the mid-1850s based on their promise to fight the slave power. If you look in their rhetoric, if you look in their campaigning material, they all say, we are going to fight the slave power. And you can see the appeal and power of that message when it's applied to Congress, because that's literally what they were doing. Working alongside Southerners, these northern fighting men stayed true to their promise, fighting Southerners with resistance, sometimes fists, and occasionally with weapons. As these northerners said time and again, they refused to be intimidated into silence by the slave power. Again and again during debate, Republicans would rise to their feet and insist they're a new kind of northerner, a northerner who had been sent to Congress to fight for their rights on the floor, for the power of the North within the Union as a whole, and for the rights of northerners to full representation. So you can really begin to see why the 1850s, and particularly the late 1850s, were the most violent years in congressional history. And that violence wasn't happening in some kind of a Washington bubble. These congressmen were acting at the urging of their constituents. Congress was a representative institution in many ways. And I found one particularly dramatic example of this link between congressmen and violence and the public in an 1856 newspaper, newspaper actually, in that database. Um, and it was a minor point. It wasn't like it was a big story. It was just sort of in the corner of the page. And it describes how a Massachusetts congressman heading back to Washington, was met at the train station by a group of his constituents with a gift that he could take back to Washington. This is 1856. The gift was a gun, and it was inscribed with the words, free speech. That's an amazingly, I mean, can you imagine? Those people wanted their congressmen to fight for their rights, right? They were saying that quite literally, and fight, Congressman did, and people at the time understood the implications 
And I want to show you an example of that by talking about a fight between one of these fighting northerners and a southerner that took place in 1858 and happens to be particularly dramatic. And it happened during an overnight session. Overnight sessions almost, I don't want to say inevitably, that's very unhistorian-like of me, but very often overnight sessions produced violence because congressmen would go out to dinner, they would drink with dinner, and then they would come back to Congress. So they were drunk and angry. And this was bad, <laughs> bad combination. Drunk, angry, and tired, and grouchy. Bad combination. Now in this case, in 1858, in an evening session, a Republican named Galusha Grow, which is the best 19th century name, Galusha Grow, from Pennsylvania, happened to be standing amidst some Southerners in the House when he objected to something that was said on the floor. Now a South Carolinian named Lawrence Kitt, who supposedly was a little bit tipsy, yelled out that Grow should object from his own part of the House, not while standing amidst Southerners. Go back to your friends. Don't stand amongst us and object. Grow, a fighting Republican, responded that it was a free house and he wouldn't take orders from a whip-holding slave driver. I always get that noise when I have that call. <laughs> and it's the right noise, ooh, right? So at this, Kit supposedly muttered, we'll see about that, and strutted over to Grow and reached out to grab Grow's collar so he could punch him. Grow beat Kit to it and punched Kit, knocking him flat instantly, pow, bang. Now at this, a stream of Southerners began to race over to the point of conflict, some maybe to break it up, more probably to join into whatever was happening. Seeing this, a stream of Republicans began racing across the House chamber, literally jumping on desks and chairs in their haste to get to a fellow Republican in trouble. And the end result was a mass brawl with scores of armed Northerners and Southerners running at each other and fighting in the space in front of the speaker's platform in the House of Representatives. And the fighting ended only when a congressman grabbed another man's hair to slug him, to punch him in the face, and to his great surprise, his hair came off because he was wearing a toupee. <laughs> Which goes to show you that slapstick is eternal. <laughs> And people laughed, and the fight actually ended with the toupee moment. There are actually images. Um, there's one from a book that I, I don't think I have a copy of, but there's an image from a book that shows this fight and, and shows the toupee, right? you, you got to show the toupee moment. Now, in the end, there wasn't a lot of damage done. There were some black eyes. There was some torn clothing. But the significance of what happened there was really clear. Reporters at the time said that the fight looked like a battle, like an honest to goodness battle, right? Armed men running at each other. And in some ways, that's precisely what it was. Now, looking back with the advantage of time, we can see where this is leading. But of course, it's important to know that people at the time did not know necessarily where things were moving to. They didn't know what was coming. And some focused on the ridiculousness of the situation, the degree to which this kind of behavior seemed to be particularly extreme and sh sort of shocking in a really sort of a way. An entire genre of congressional humor broke out in the 1850s. There's humorous epic poems, there's cartoons, there's a humor magazine that came out, I think the first issue was right after the toupee moment. And I, to myself, I always refer to this magazine as Congressional Fights Quarterly because it's just, <laughs> It's just one fight after another, but they're making fun of the fights, right? Um, there's, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, actually, the cover of the first issue shows two congressmen throwing things at each other, right? A podium, a toupee, a, a weasel, like this. Like. So the fighting, and actually what's fascinating about that is the, there's a genre of article um, in that magazine that would look at one week's debates and pick out the most ridiculous lines and, and weave them together into an article. And to understand why that was funny, you had to really be following the debates. So the, the familiarity that the public had with what was going on in Congress is actually really remarkable. I mean, I could look at it and go, oh, you know, that's what Smith said in January. It's like, but they assumed the public could do that too. So not. Some people were laughing, but not everyone was laughing. And a good many people became increasingly angry at people from opposing part, the opposing parts from the Union, and obviously increasingly concerned about the Union itself. 
Anger, outrage, concern, laughter, intimidation. In many ways, the road to civil warfare as reflected in Congress was a story of a trajectory of emotion concerning the sectional other in Congress and in the Union. And in fact, part of what I really wanted to accomplish in my book was to look at a seemingly conventional political story, right, the coming of the Civil War, through a less conventional lens. So I really wanted to look at how people in Congress behaved, right, and why they behaved that way, and what were the implications of that behavior. And emotion, as a political tool and a power dynamic, was a big part of that story. But of course, that's easy for me to say, how do you tell that story? It, was, I had a, it took me forever to figure out how to tell this story. One of the foremost challenges, other than piecing together these fights that I had in writing the book. And in the end, to solve that problem, I decided to put a guide of sorts at the center of the book. Not really a narrator, but someone who you meet at the beginning of the book and who you can get to know and then travel with throughout the book, looking at changing events through his eyes. To accomplish this, I used the diary of Benjamin Brown French. Now, French at the time was, even now, but then particularly, was no one very famous or important. He was a minor clerk in the House of Representatives for a time, one term. He was the clerk of the House. He came from remote rural New Hampshire and came to Washington and was amazed by what he saw. And luckily for me and historians, kept an amazing diary, an 11 volume diary, filled with his reflections and thoughts and feelings about Congress, as well as details of a lot of fights, right? He, he included the sound effects in his diary. When I was writing the book, you know, he also had a newspaper column. He wrote poetry about congressional politics. I, some of the footnotes in my book I put there because I thought, no one will believe that this guy exists. Right? <laughs> They're going to think I made him up. I mean, he's such a great source of evidence. His diary was amazing. But more than that, and the real reason he's at the center of my book, is because he undergoes a really remarkable transition over the years covered by the book. So he comes to Washington in 1833 as what would have been called a doe-faced Democrat meaning a Northern Democrat willing to do anything to appease the South and promote his party and hopefully to save the Union. He was liked by Northerners and Southerners alike. He was liked by Whigs and Democrats. Probably the best proof of his likability is the fact that he was unanimously elected clerk of the House, which is not an easy thing to do in Congress. In 1860, this same man went out to buy a gun in case he needed to shoot some Southerners. By that time in his diary, he's denouncing them as slaveocrats. That's an amazing transition. And my thought in writing the book was that if you meet, if a reader met French at the beginning of the book when he was desperately trying to appease Southerners and then understands how and why that same person is willing to shoot them by the book's end, so if you can understand that trajectory of emotion and logic and what it suggests, about the road to civil war, well, that's really a new kind of a thread of understanding in the meaning and experience of traveling that road. So in essence, French enabled me to explore what I call the emotional logic of disunion, the gradual ground level process by which Americans learn to turn on each other to the point of violence. With Congress as a representative institution in every sense of the word, revealing how that emotional logic progressed over time. And of course, that emotion, that the logic of disunion bound up with emotion was visible both inside and outside of Congress. In Congress, by 1860, most congressmen were armed and many expected armed conflict to break out on the floor of the House or Senate. So for example, South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond wrote a remarkable letter in 1860. This is a great example of um, primary evidence, like it being a useful thing to read all the primary evidence read it straight through and not pull the juicy quote that everybody else pulls. So this letter, everybody who writes about the coming of the Civil War has the same paragraph in their book that says, wow, it really got violent in Congress. And James Henry Hammond said, and here's the quote, so far as I know and as I believe, every man in both houses is armed with a revolver, some with two, and a bowie knife. Right? That quote, look in any book on the coming of the Civil War, and somehow that quote is there. Well, I went to the original letter. What's far more interesting than that is his explanation of why he has a gun. 
he says, you know, I only once in my life have I carried a gun. I didn't like it. I put it down. And right now, I have a loaded gun in my desk. And the only reason it's here is because I'm afraid that warfare is going to break out between Northerners and Southerners on the floor. And if that happens, I'm going to fight alongside the South. He's talking about Congress. He says, the wrong words from a Republican could precipitate at any moment a collision in which the slaughter would be such as to shock the world and dissolve the government. That's the interesting part of that letter. It's a shocking part of the letter. He then goes on to explain, that's why I have this gun, and that's why a lot of other people do. It's not because they wanted to shoot each other. They were afraid that they might have to. If armed warfare broke out in Congress, these people wanted to be armed and ready to fight. Benjamin Brown French bought a gun in 1860 for the same reason. He was not eager to shoot Southerners, but he was afraid that he might have to. And of course, wonderful Benjamin Brown French explains in his diary. He gets very upset at what he's seeing. He says something along the lines of, I went into town today, I was so upset, and I bought a gun, one of those little guns you could keep in your pocket all the time. And I'm going to wear it all the time, because if we're going to be attacked for our feelings about Southerners, I'm going to be ready to fight. He was thinking that way, and he wasn't alone. A lot of other people reasoned their way into seeing their sectional opposite as an un-American other, sacrificing national interests for their own selfish sectional desires. Now, obviously, this is a really powerful story, and it has some familiar echoes in it, right? It, it shows extreme polarization. It shows conflicting visions of what kind of nation the United States would be. It shows splintering political parties. It shows new technologies complicating the conversation of politics, and it shows rampant distrust in national political institutions. Obvious echoes. So it's important for me to say, in talking about this, I'm not trying to make some kind of implicit statement about modern day politics. But what is worth noting is that the United States has had moments in the past that resemble our present. And those are usually moments in which Americans feel that some kind of a national pathway is being chosen, some kind of major decision is being made that suggests it's really going to shape the nation's future. And those moments tend to be ugly, polarizing moments. The 1790s, the late 1790s was one such moment when really it was the workings of democracy in the new republic that was being debated. The 1850s obviously was another and it's slavery that's causing this polarization. The 1960s was another when civil rights were under debate and we are now at another such moment when citizenship really is what's being fought over. All of these moments were pathway moments when serious talk of some kind of fundamental change in the national ethos was in the air. And what saves us during those kinds of moments is our political process. The founding generation believed that one of the most significant things that they did for the future of the nation was creating a defined, documented constitutional process and setting it in motion. It's why James Madison took such careful notes during the Constitutional Convention, documenting precisely how the Constitution was made, partly for the American nation to understand how it was supposed to work, and partly so that other nations that wanted to do the same thing would have a sort of guidebook. As Hamilton wrote in the first, and I can't resist the Hamilton quote in almost everything I do. As Hamilton wrote in the first paragraph of the first Federalist essay, most nations are founded based on accident and force. But the Americans were trying something different. They were creating a government through a process of reflection and choice. And they assumed that during moments of crisis to come, this constitutional process set in motion through reflection and choice and grounded on debate and compromise would be the key to national survival. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.